Hello, everyone, and welcome to our program this afternoon with Sandra Zalman, editor of the new book, Modern in the Making, MoMA and the Modern Experiment, 1929 to 1949. I'm Natalie Dupeche. I'm the assistant curator of modern art here at the Manila Collection, and I am delighted to be joined this afternoon by Sandra in Houston. Sandra is the Associate Professor and Program Director of the Art History Department at the University of Houston, where she teaches classes on modern and contemporary art museums and curatorial issues. Hi, Sandra. Hi. And our Manila audiences may remember you from 2016 when you were, I suppose, uh, in real life on to discuss your first book, Consuming Surrealism in American Culture, which is wonderful. And I turn to again and again as a really brilliant resource. So we are delighted to have you back today to talk about your new book, which I have here, Modern in the Making, which encompasses 14 essays and explores the ways in which which during its first 20 years, the Museum of Modern Art acted as a kind of laboratory to set an ambitious agenda for the exhibition of a multidisciplinary uh, understanding of modern art. So the way this will work this afternoon is that Sandra is going to speak for about 20 minutes, um, give a kind of presentation on her subject. And after that, I will come back and join her for a conversation. Um, and we invite our audience members to submit questions throughout, um, which you can do by emailing programs at manil.org and they'll get fed to us throughout the next hour or so. Um, so we'll look forward to getting to as much of those um, as possible. Um, and now, Sandra, the floor is yours to talk about your book. <laughs> thank you so much, Natalie. Um, and I really want to thank everyone at the Manil for hosting me, especially Natalie and Lauren for their enthusiasm about this program, and Tony and Ben for helping out behind the scenes, and Paul Forsyth in the bookstore for his support. Um, I wanted to start with a little behind the scenes myself, and um, perhaps I can have the first slide. Thank you. Okay, that's the cover of the book. So the next slide. Um, I wanted to talk a bit about how this book came to be. Um, the idea for this book began in 2015 uh, with a walkthrough of an exhibition of the work of Peter Bloom, uh, who you're seeing on the screen. Um, in the context of an exhibition uh, at the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts. And I was walking through this exhibition with Austin Porter, who is an assistant professor of art history at Kenyon College in Ohio. Um, we'd both been invited to present at a symposium on Peter Bloom, but it was we only really met when the curator, uh, Bob Casolino, was giving us a tour of the exhibition. So today, um, really almost no one I think had heard has heard of Peter Bloom, especially in 2015 before Bob did his exhibition. But back in the 1930s and 40s, Peter Bloom was a very famous um, and highly regarded painter. And he was so well regarded that when MoMA purchased this painting, The Eternal City in 1943, they called it the most important American acquisition to date. That's um, from a Newsweek article that I'm showing you on the right hand side that was repeated in press releases. It was repeated in many articles. And so two thoughts came to mind uh, when I see Peter Bloom's work. One was how influenced he was by figurative surrealism. Um, and the second is how at this particular moment when American art was coming into its own, MoMA was hitching its wagon to Peter Bloom. And this wasn't the only peculiar choice MoMA made in the 1940s. Uh, can I have the next slide? In 1943, Alfred Barr, the founding director of MoMA, approved an exhibition of the self-trained painter Morris Hirschfield and the display of this blinged out shoeshine stand um, by a man named Joe Malone. And these are far from the canonical works that we would you know, now associate with MoMA. The story of the shoeshine stand, as relayed in the press release issued by the museum, was that Louise Nevelson discovered it and then convinced the museum that it should be shown. And then um, Barr is quoted in the press release, can I have the next slide, um, singing its praises. 
And I think Barr just really enjoyed the way it looked. And obviously so did Louise Nevelson. So it was exhibited in the lobby at MoMA in this kind of festive uh, Christmas context. So talking about this, Austin and I decide on the spot in the galleries that we want to tell the story of MoMA's early years, especially like what we were calling the weird 1940s. And that it, this should be an edited volume because MoMA's exhibitions were so varied and so eclectic that part of the point was that we didn't want there to be like one authoritarian voice. We wanted it to be kind of multi-authored. Um, can I get the next slide? Just a few months after MoMA proclaims that Peter Bloom's painting is the most important American acquisition to date, Jackson Pollock had his first solo show at Peggy Guggenheim's gallery. And Alfred Barr quietly acquired this painting, She-Wolf, for the museum. So I think the conventional art historical story is that Pollock bursts on the scene and MoMA becomes this bastion of formalist abstraction. But it's clear when we look at the history that curators at MoMA did not immediately know how to characterize American art. Um, can I get the next slide? When we reconsider MoMA's early years, it's also important to recognize just how all in the staff was about democratizing art for the public. Um, I'm showing you kind of the Met and MoMA both in 1939, because you can see when you look at the Met's facade, it has this kind of promise of a Greek temple to which you ascend to gain some kind of enlightened wisdom. And when MoMA's building was unveiled in 1939, um, for its first 10 years, it had been operating out of a series of temporary spaces. You can see some of its more democratic ideals reflected in its architecture. So it looks basically like a factory, um, maybe accepting the fact that natural light was a big part of the design. And then like a department store, it has its name on the side of the building. I keep thinking like that's something that Macy's would have or something. Most importantly, it had a sidewalk level entrance. So theoretically, you can just be kind of strolling down the street or window shopping on Fifth Avenue, turn the corner and boom, you're at MoMA. Um, can I get the next slide? So another part of our mission um, when Austin and I wanted to, what we wanted to do with this volume was to correct some of the stereotypes of MoMA as this kind of white cube gallery space intent on promoting abstraction. I really saw this as like a convenient myth. It's still promoted in the popular press um, as this, that Alfred Barr, the founding director, had a teleological view of modern art that was somehow already plotted out before the museum was even created. And I think part of the reason that Barr has this reputation is because of this chart that he made for a show in 1936, Cubism and Abstract Art. Um, but actually, at the same time, Barr was openly declaring that MoMA was a laboratory. And in 1939, um, he said that in 1939, when the new building was opened. And then in 1942, he says that he doesn't mind getting things wrong. He says, today's masterpieces is sometimes tomorrow's bore. The museum is aware that it may often guess wrong in its acquisitions. And when it acquires a dozen paintings, it'll be lucky if in 20 years, only one will survive. For the future, the important problem is to acquire this one. The other nine will be forgotten and forgiven. So Barr did end up building a canon of modern art, but MoMA was just as passionate about things like toaster design. Can I get the next slide? Um, so they have an, there's an exhibition in 1942-43 of useful objects in wartime, which was one of a, you know, a constant theme of MoMA was these useful objects shows and they start out at useful objects for $5, useful objects for $10 and they kind of go up with inflation. Um, but here they're telling you like absolutely under no circumstances do not buy the toaster of 1940. Like you absolutely need to get the toaster of 1934. And the reason is because the toaster of 1940 looks like it's gonna hurl through the air and it has, if you read the text, it says like this object has never been exhibited at MoMA. Um, which is just really funny to me because the toaster of 1934 could be exhibited at Mo MoMA. It's also funny on a personal note because I have a toaster that looks exactly like the toaster of 1940. Um, 
I guess, you know, because I guess it does look like 1940, whereas the 1934 toaster looks um, kind of classic, like it, it won't ever go out of style. Um, so this exhibition, Useful Objects in Wartime, embodies a lot of what MoMA was doing in the 1940s, which included shows of industrial design um, and a lot of exhibitions in support of the Allied cause. So many so that, you know, MoMA's um, uh, shows started looking a lot like propaganda, which they were. <laughs> um, and can I get the next slide? Another part of the reason Austin and I wanted to focus on exhibitions was because for its first 20 years, MoMA didn't have a permanent collection. It really operated more like a Kunsthalle. And so this image, which eventually became the cover of the book, shows how multifaceted MoMA was. It was engaged in all sorts of activities beyond just um, displaying art. And I should mention that when I found this image in the archives, like I really wanted to like do a dance. I knew I was gonna use it somehow, um, but it actually, Austin and I had to convince the publisher to use it because at first they said it was too busy. And for us, that was really the point that this MoMA wasn't an austere place. It was buzzing and I loved how colorful it was. So it helps us also like dispel that white cube idea. So when we zoom in, can I get the next slide? We can see the front desk where all sorts of people are browsing, um, including active duty military. Um, and according to a 1940 report, MoMA was selling about 339 postcards and 25 color reproductions per day. So you can kind of see there's people at the front desk and they're like handling color reproductions of works that are on the floor above, especially that Miro. What this image also shows is that is the first time that Alfred Barr installed the museum collection. And he was very keen to call it a museum collection and not a permanent collection because the museum collection was conceived to be ever changing. So works older than 50 years were intended to go to the Metropolitan Museum if they had achieved historical significance. And if not, I guess they were just meant to disappear. So here, Barr gets to show off what he's acquired, um, but without the idea that there's a firm narrative of modern art. Next slide, please. If we go down to the basement, which we ended up cutting off the corner, partly um, because I think this movie theater is supposed to depict like a John Wayne movie and John Wayne is canceled because he was an admitted white supremacist. Um, if we go down to the basement, you see that MoMA has a movie theater. This was a huge part of the 1939 building. They had twice daily showings um, and they were not of avant-garde films. They were of really popular movies. Um, and then you can also see this exhibition, which I just found in preparing uh, for this talk, but this was an exhibition of modern American dance um, as represented in um, photographs, which is something that Swagato Chakravorty addresses in his essay in our book, um, which is that MoMA had dozens of exhibitions of dance, mainly via photography, and that this was sort of a prelude to the exhibition of performance in the museum space. Uh, next, please. On the left-hand side of this image, which is not in the book, um, you can see how invested MoMA is in the idea of reproductions, which is something that many of our authors address, but is probably best embodied in Rachel Kaplan's essay, which discusses how MoMA's circulating exhibition program um, put out hundreds of exhibitions, really. And so if you look, you can see that represented also in the trucks on the left-hand side, the truck that um, art handlers are kind of putting paintings in. But MoMA sent out a lot of traveling exhibitions that were just of, of, of reproductions mounted on boards. Um, and they went to YMCA's, they went to community centers all across the country. So the museum's reach was really widespread across the country, especially as an educational resource. You'll also see um, children creating art in this section of the image, which is something John Blakinger addresses in his essay. And Suzanne Hudson writes about in her essay about how the educational initiatives of MoMA were expanded to include veterans. And you can see active duty military kind of all over um, 
this image. But you'll notice the children are making art, you know, almost adjacent or almost in MoMA's gallery space. Um, so that was another kind of important thing that we wanted to bring forward was Alfred Barr's hiring of Victor D'Amico to head up an education department in 1937. Uh, next slide, please. So returning to the moment that this image pictures, it's Barr's first time installing a comprehensive vision of the collection. And Bloom's painting is given pride of place. Um, and so is Chelichev's hide and seek, which you'll see in the next image. Can I get the next? Yes, there you go. And I wanted to point out something that I've done as another kind of intervention um, into kind of dispelling that the whiteness of the walls is that I have put the paintings, the color part of the paintings back into these photographs um, in a way that's a bit unnatural, but also I really wanted to kind of revivify this moment in history. And Chelichev's painting in particular is, is has wild colors. Um, Barr puts it next to Siqueiros, um, Echo of a Scream. So it also really speaks to the historical moment. Um, and Chelichev's Hide and Seek painting was MoMA's most popular painting for a number of years. Um, Siqueiros is interesting because also MoMA was heavily invested in Latin American art early on. And in the next slide, please. Um, you will see Wilfredo Lamb, a Cuban surrealist painter who was also collected by the Manils. And I want to point out not against those kind of modernist white walls that we've come to associate with MoMA. So even when Barr and curator Dorothy Miller, oops, can I get the next one, please? Thank you. So here again, I've sort of colorized it and you can see like there's part of the white and then there's part of you know this other color, which I hope from the cover image of the book, you can see what MoMA was truly a colorful place. Um, but Barr and curator Dorothy Miller then reinstall American painting from the museum collection in 1948-49, um, which is something that art historian Angela Miller writes about in her chapter. And you'll see that they place Pollock in this surrealist context just before the moment when he's being hailed as possibly America's greatest living artist. Um, so again, I just sort of want to stress like MoMA didn't have all the answers, didn't know exactly who, who to hitch their wagon to. And that was something we really wanted to recover um, in, in the book, in telling the sort of untold stories of MoMA's first 20 years. Can I get the next slide? Um, so MoMA's 20th anniversary exhibitions are also a really interesting moment. The staff still had what I would call almost like an anxiety about if the public really liked modern art. And so this exhibition, Modern Art in Your Life, was designed like explicitly to convince the public that modern art was a safe space um, and they were already quite familiar with it, even if they didn't yet know it. Um, so Modern Art in Your Life kind of took avant-garde painting and sculpture and then sort of showed how it was applied in the world. Um, so you can see you go through a passage of ARP sculptures, ARP reliefs, and you'll enter a space of chairs, modernist chairs, one of which I'm sitting in. Um, and so this exhibition also included a Lazy Susan. It included uh, wallpaper. It included skyscrapers. Um, so they're saying, like, if you're familiar with all of this stuff, tissue boxes, then you already have modern art in your life. Can I get the next slide? Um, and then when we get to this moment, still in the same exhibition, you go through this surrealist kind of passage that's flanked by Dali's Persistence of Memory on, and Yves Tanguy. And you go in and MoMA's curator, Rene Darncourt, who succeeded Barr as director, um, you go in and you're in this space where six full scale Fifth Avenue shop windows are recreated. And this is how surrealism is in your life. Like if you like to shop, you've already encountered surrealism, you're already familiar with modern art. Um, and so it's this really kind of creepy, cool space, but it also really cements for me the notion that MoMA didn't mind sometimes repeating or um, co-opting the space of the department store. There were products, it's hard to see in the slides, but there are neckties for sale. There's jewelry for sale, like in these windows, 
which are in MoMA, but you could potentially like leave the museum and go buy those products. Can I get the next slide? So another facet of MoMA's kind of principles and another thing that comes out in its 20th anniversary shows is that um, modern art was not a radical break from the past. Um, Barr and other curators really saw modernism as something that was interconnected with all periods of history. And this fundraising brochure from 1946 really highlights that, like modern art 5,000 years ago looked like this, modern art yesterday, which was slash the Renaissance looked like this, and here's modern art today, and they show their own building and Picasso. Um, so that's something that was represented again and again in the galleries, and something I also feel like is a good parallel with the Manil collection today. Um, can I get the next slide? Also, as seen in this other 20th anniversary exhibition, Timeless Aspects of Modern Art. So this show opened the 20th anniversary year and Modern Art in Your Life closed the 20th anniversary year. In this exhibition, um, Renee Darnancourt kind of gives you this funny plan. And again, it's not teleological. It doesn't presume that we have to start in one place and end in another place. It's really meandering on purpose where he places side by side ancient and old art next to modernist works. Um, can we get the next slide? And this is something that really reminds me of the, Manil, uh, the Manil's collecting ethos. Um, here we see um, Christ mocked by soldiers. We see an image of a synagogue, a Jewish synagogue. And in between is a Romanesque crucifix um, from the year 1200. So just gathering all of these objects in the space of a modern art museum was a kind of um, an interesting move, you know, because it's like de-radical, de-emphasizing that break that we kind of think of that happens with the avant-garde in the late 19th century. Um, can I get the next slide? Uh, and so I want to kind of end on this image that returns Peter Bloom to the space of MoMA's galleries after eons off stage in storage. Um, so this is these are images from the 2019 reinstallation that the Museum of Modern Art uh, just did. And here's Peter Bloom again, looking like fresh and new and different as we start to kind of disrupt that idea of the canon that MoMA built up. Um, I think MoMA is kind of mining its own history and realizing that it, it, has, it has the objects that could also disrupt its own canonical narrative. So here on the left, Peter Bloom is in context of, of responding to war. So he's being shown with Picasso. And then on the right, there's also kind of a glimpse into the Surrealist galleries where we see just this hint of a Magritte painting. Um, so just even following kind of the course of Peter Bloom and seeing him come back, I guess, was is really interesting because that happened over the course of the time that Austin and I were putting the book together. Um, and so I will end there and maybe Natalie and I will talk a little bit about the parallels with the Manil's collecting ethos, which are, are many and diverse. Um, and then I'm looking forward to questions. Thank you. Thank you, Sandra. That was that was so wonderful. I mean, I feel like I've learned so much from your book and there are, as you mentioned, I mean, many and surprising parallels between this, particularly as, you know, the subject of your book, these kind of experimental, quirky first 20 years of MoMA's history and um, some of the ideals or ideas behind um, the Manila's, it came into formation. Um, before we delve too much into that, I wanted to pose a question um, that is something that I also remarked on as you were speaking just now and had not realized, which is that works, MoMA's works were meant to, or originally meant to um, go to the Met after having been part of MoMA's collection for 50 years. Um, and I wondered if you know when that, because obviously that doesn't happen now. Obviously <laughs> now it does kind of plot a, a historical, in some ways linear, 
with occasional disruptions that are very kind of deliberate and interesting, but you do start on the fifth floor with, you know, Starry Night and Cezanne and 1890s, and then proceed in a more or less chronological fashion down through the next um, two floors. So obviously they don't do that. Um, but do you know when and why Moments decided to keep its collection rather than ceding it to the Met and anything about that kind of um, you know, process when they decided, no, we would really rather hang on to some of these? Yeah, I mean, that was, uh, there, there's many reasons I think why that happened, but the real break comes in 1953 um, so they, MoMA was conceived with this idea that it would be passing works to the Met. Um, and they don't sign a formal agreement about it for a while, but it always, that was the, the general plan that the collection should be as permanent as a stream. So like the stream uh -huh. goes forward in time, giving MoMA this very dynamic collection. And when works were 50 years old, they would be ceded to the Met. Um, and this agreement just was not practical in part because so many reasons in part because um patrons didn't collectors didn't want to give their works to moma if they knew it was they were just going to end up in the met so why not just give them to the met uh -huh. in part because mm -hmm. alfred barr is still like he spends his entire career at moma and i think he genuinely grows fond of these works um so i think there's like a bit of a personal thing of like uh, we made these works in part what they are and, you know, a, a kind of wanting to hold on to them. And yeah, just financially, it didn't really make sense, I think. Uh -huh. So 1953 is that break, but you can start to see it happening um, in the early, even earlier in the 1950s, which is another part of the reason we wanted to kind of bracket off MoMA's 20 years. Um, was because that was still in play in those first 20 years. And then this after idea, 20 years, just, yeah. The idea of it being, the collection being as permanent as a stream, that's a really interesting phrasing because in a way, all of the collection um, doesn't, I mean, has a sort of different quality now. It's almost like they've said, we want the collection galleries to be as permanent as a stream because part of the change that Man that MoMA brought to the collection display galleries when they did as you mentioned the sort of big um new overhaul last year with like new MoMA is that there has been um instituted now a plan for the kind of regular rotation of works on and off stage um so where collection galleries previously had I think more or less remained static unless something had to go off on a loan or come down for conservation treatment or something. Now there is a real programmatic um, and kind of deliberate spacing of every six months we rotate 20% of the collection. So they've almost like, I think, kept that idea of impermanence, but instead of applying it to the actual collection and the actual works are applying it more almost to like the visitor experience of you need to keep like coming back and renewing, you know, renewing your relationship with the museum because it is always changing now. Yes, which is another parallel, of course, as you know, to the Manila collection, which has been yeah. <laughs> for ages. Um, and I think that's part of Dominic de Manil's desire to have this like kind of neighborhood museum where you return and are rewarded for returning because the collection is reinstalled so frequently. And so you mm -hmm. can be old friends in new contexts. Yes, totally. And the fact of it, of her wanting to have it be, um, a sort of neighborhood museums. I, I hadn't somehow noticed or like picked up on this parallel, but even the fact that at MoMA, one does just walk in off the street. And in fact, there aren't those kind of, you know, heraldic stairs that you have to ascend the way you do at the Met. And sort of so too at the Manila, as you know, it's, you know, part of a of many levels of trying to make the museum, I think, for the 
people of Houston, which is how Dominique phrased it when she opened the museum um, more than 30 years ago in 1987, that it is meant to fit into the geography and space of Montrose that when you approach it from the front, it is, you know, seems to be a single story building. There is a second story, but you can only see it from the back. Mm -hmm. um, and you don't, you know, admission is free, of course, programs are free, you don't ascend stairs, and it's meant to um, really fit into that kind of fabric, which in, in a way, MoMA does too, just with a very different kind of neighborhood fabric, like in the, you know, sort of heights of midtown Manhattan. <laughs> yes. And also I was thinking about like the domestic scale of the Manila collection. Uh -huh, like, uh -huh. When MoMA new building was unveiled in 1939 obviously the architecture was not domestic but it did preserve there was the backyard otherwise uh -huh. the sculpture garden yeah it's referred to as a backyard uh, funny. so there was like these, there were these moments of domesticity at moma um, yeah yeah that's really great. I hadn't realized that they called the sculpture garden the backyard because it had I mean it feels much more like you know, sort of modest than calling it the sculpture garden. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it used to be, of course, a lot smaller before Philip Johnson mm -hmm. uh, kind of expanded it twice. So um, that's another connection we could talk about is Philip Johnson's role um, in, in at MoMA as the head of the director of the architecture department, which of course was the first in the country. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And then also how the Manils kind of came to Philip Johnson and had him, uh, they commissioned him for their ha their home. Yes. The yes. And I mean, I think as far as I understand, it was among the first kind of modernist homes in Houston and very different from um, the River Oaks um you know, what one would traditionally associate with the homes that are built in River Oaks. It's over um, a large plot of land or a large um, sort of three actual lots, but is set back from the street, is only one floor. So it too has a kind of, um, you know, a, there's a relationship too between their original home that he built in the 1940s and the museum building that, um, Renzo Piano would design uh, in the 1980s to house the collection that had, you know, formerly lived um, in this kind of, in part at least, in this um, really domestic setting. Um, I wanted to ask um, another question, sort of thinking about MoMA being situated in Midtown Manhattan and being in fact surrounded by department stores, not just having like bringing it into the gallery. So one question we got is whether there's more to say on this relationship between the department store and MoMA. And does this relationship begin before 1949? Um, this question is from Rex Koontz and he points out that the relationship of the Foley's in Houston and Dallas and the rise of those museums is another important connection between um, you know, department store families and the museum. So I don't know if there's more for, you know, that you could share about yeah. that. Um, this is something I've written about elsewhere, but Alfred Barr was really eager for these kind of department store tie-ins. Um, the first time we see a connection between MoMA and the department store, I think is 1935 with this blockbuster Vincent Van Gogh show that MoMA did. Mm -hmm. And there are store windows that have like Van Gogh kind of quotation, you know, they like print Van Gogh stuff on, on fabric, right? Um, and then in 1936, much more dynamically, um, there are store windows designed at Bonwit Tellers that um, are in the surrealist vein um, that actually include Alfred Barr's catalog for his big surrealism show in the window. So um, that's a real moment of like cross promotion, very yeah. deliberate cross pollination. <laughs> Absolutely. Yes. And then, of course, there's all of these like useful objects uh, mm -hmm. exhibitions, you know, so MoMA was very involved, did not shy away from consumer culture and in fact was kind of cultivating it um, in its in its galleries. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, maybe we want to pull up. Um, one of the, because I know one of the um, sort of perhaps more surprising um, 
parallels between MoMA and the Manilas that there was this interest in education that I know you talked about um, with MoMA through the fact that they hired Victor D'Amico as the, was it the head of the kind of education department or to sort of put together that department in the first place in 1937. And, and the, the de Manils also had um, a real interest in that, that they expressed early on in their art collecting by being involved with um, sep, like two other museums in Houston. This was before they had their own, um, you know, the, before the Manil Collection building existed even as an idea, and also with two um, universities in town. But maybe you want to tell us a little bit more about the how, how MoMA sort of thought about education, how perhaps Barr wrote about the purpose of the museum and its relationship to educating the public? Yeah, well, Barr comes from an educational background. He was a professor at Wellesley, um, and he taught the first class on 20th century art because there simply like wasn't, that didn't exist as, as, a, as a class, right? Barr was trained as a medievalist, um, which mm -hmm. is another great, Manila collect, uh, connection. Um, but Barr, so Barr is a professor first, which um, Richard Meyer has a great chapter about. And he's really engaged in kind of, of um, proselytizing about modern art. And Victor D'Amico had, was like very steeped in the theories of John Dewey and um, was very into this idea of like learning by doing, um, mm -hmm. which some of our authors in the book talk about in the context of children, like inviting children into the galleries and having like this really vibrant kind of children's art making program, but also veterans. Um, so there, the, there was also like the People's Art Center, which Suzanne Hudson writes about, um, that invited veterans to kind of make objects and um, train them in art making skills. And as you mentioned, Dominique de Manil and John de Manil started kind of their art collecting, a, a big part of their art collecting was in the context of St. Thomas University's art department. And mm -hmm. they sponsored um, Jermaine McKeggy as an art professor there. And they used their collection as a teaching collection, which I think is really lesser, a, a lesser known part of their history. Um, yeah, absolutely. And they, I think really saw, I mean, this sort of, to, to me at least, this relates this, um, Sort of interest in education and in sharing their collection with Saint, the students and you know you know and faculty at the University of Saint Thomas relates to their conviction and belief that art was really essential to to all human experience and a real like deep seated um, belief. Um, belief almost feels too flimsy of a word, although I know it's the one that dominates. Conviction. <laughs> But yes, that it was that it was not something for the elite, that it was needed to be um, kind of contiguous with one's life and that it was, um, you know, really an essential part of the human experience. Um, and I think it's interesting that I believe I'm like looking at your book right now, but that Barr also at some point fr formulates the mission of the Museum of Modern Art as being like, what was it like? There are three. Oh yeah, <laughs> to uh, like to educate and show people how to use modern art. I mean, it's really interesting that it is so kind of publicly oriented in a certain way. Yes, and in fact, like MoMA gets taken to task by artists who are upset that they're not represented in the collection or they're not shown um, because they're like, "Why aren't you serving us, the artists?" And Barr is mm -hmm. always like, "I'm sorry, I'm serving the public." Um, mm -hmm. So, for instance, like when he's planning that big surrealism show in 1936, Andre Breton is, is is upset about the other objects in the exhibition, and you know, Barr doesn't care. He yes. can't, you know, Breton is like, how could he even tell the curator what to put in the show? But then right. Breton is also going to pull his collection from the show, so. It's this real yeah. moment, like a standoff between them about what that show is going to look like. And Barr just holds his ground. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. This is for fantastic art, Dada Surrealism, this landmark show that opens at the museum in December 1936. And I, I think that Breton really wanted it to be, um, you know, a sort of 
um, exhibition for and of the like surrealist group as it existed in that moment. And as the title already kind of indicates, it went way beyond the sort of group dynamics that were at play in like summer of 1936 when he was in Paris to like find works to put in that show. Um, and it was a much more kind of wide ranging um, you know, presentation of not just the surrealist movement and artists associated with it, but its roots, its very deep roots in many cases with like Gothic art and, um, you know, centuries old, but him sort of tracing the, a, a sort of indirect lineage that led to the, the movement in the 1930s. Yes, and I also have a slide, I think it's the second to the last slide of, of the folk objects that Barr included. Um, in that show that, you know, he was the one who was just like, oh, I think this object that consists of like a folded up Sears Roebuck catalog um, uh -huh. evokes the surrealist spirit. And so he puts that in the show too. So alongside these really, you know, 500 year old paintings, he also has folk objects that were made in 1936. Is it possible to get that slide up? Um, oh, perfect, thank you. Um, you're seeing it in this kind of uh, plexiglass case on the right, alongside this pastel from 1875 that also had nothing to do with surrealism per se, but Barr puts in the show. And now MoMA's curators, probably Anne Umland, um, have, have kind of rediscovered in MoMA's storage and have put out on view. Uh-huh, uh-huh, because it's, I it's labeled on there, but just to sort of call it out explicitly that this image, um, the installation image on the right with the wonderful sort of rose walls is from the reinstallation that was put up. Oh, about a year ago now, I guess, although it feels like longer ago. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but, um, and, and I mean, of course, another parallel that, um, you know, we can talk about between the two museums is this, um, you know, long term um, expansive interest in surrealism, which is, of course, a real like collecting strength of the Minnell collection. Um, the Min the Diminels were friends with Max Ernst and with Rene Magritte and um, real patrons of them, sort of thinking too about how I mentioned earlier, their interest in um, education, they funded the publication, the research and publication of the catalog raisonnés of both of these artists. Oh, yeah. So which there was I a, right here. <laughs> which are like mammoth, you know, volumes, yes. I mean, like tremendous, tremendous amounts of works, but speaking to a real kind of dedication to working with um, living artists that um, they did not just for them, but also for, um, for lots of other artists that we could talk about. But this this interest in surrealism is another um, kind of parallel between the two, of course. Yeah, can we go to the image of Dominique and Germain um, in front of the Magritte Dominion of Light? Oh yeah, I think that might be the first one of yours at the end. But this is a painting, um, a Magritte painting that we're about to see um, called Dominion of Light. Um, yeah, there it is. <laughs> there it is, yes. Uh, what I love about this painting is that the Manils bought it three times. They bought three Dominion yeah. of Lights. Um, Magritte painted 17 versions, but the Manils bought it early in the 50s and donated it to MoMA. Um, then they bought another version, I think on behalf of one of their children, and then they bought mm -hmm. a third version that is hanging in the Manil collection. Um, yes. So they deeply, like they were really supporting, as you said, certain artists like Magritte. And they're also, I mean, because I think John and Dominique de Manil were not as concerned with like any kind of narrativizing or canonical mm -hmm. um, kind of issues, they were able to just collect deeply the artists that they loved um, and got into Magritte really like on the ground floor. So Magritte is pretty, um, bargain basement in the 50s. Uh -huh. And um, his prices don't start to go up until the later 1960s um, in the context, you know, when when pop art kind of comes about. Um, yeah, which is really, um, I think, something that I learned a lot about from your first book, Consuming Surrealism in American Culture. <laughs> but that, that interest um, 
you know, post-war in the kind of later Magritte's like this that get to be really kind of um, like poppy and kind of, you know, painted in a different way than his works in the, from the 19, late 20s and 30s, I guess I'll say, yeah. which um, just also kind of parenthetically, um, we were mentioning about the regular rotation of galleries, which is, um, you know, a way of, you know, not only keeping the collection lively, I think, but to um, really make an engaging experience for visitors, um, since potentially if you come in once a quarter, something will be different. But we are going to be re-hanging uh, the surrealism galleries, oh, like in the next 10 days or two weeks, and there's going to be one gallery that features some of the Magritte's early paintings that he did between in Paris from late 1927 until he left in 1930. So three years that were in the end, some of the most productive of his life um, and have, that have a sort of very different feel. There's some works that people I've you know, certainly seen before, but I'm really looking forward to uniting them all together. And then in a different um, space in the galleries, there will be a kind of presentation of some of late works by Magritte, like Dominion of Light. Um, which is of course like a great favorite, this image of the, you know, evening on a bourgeois street with really fluffy cumulus clouds above. Yeah, and I think you're able to put on such a, a great presentation of Magritte because the Manils own, uh, you know, the biggest collection of Magritte oil paintings outside of Belgium. So, you know, yeah. they were not afraid to keep collecting Magritte, um, which I think is, is one of the strengths of the collection was their support for, say surrealism when it was kind of uh, less avant-garde um, and, and the way there's these constant connections between, um, you know, modern works of art with, with older works of art. The Manils mm -hmm. believed in that, that there wasn't also the, similarly to MoMA's early years, like there wasn't a radical break that you can kind of mix it up in the galleries. Yes. In a way it reminds me, um, I mean, not in a sort of purposeful or directed sense, but of Sai Twombly, who of course has um, a, the Manil has the Sai Twombly Gallery, which is a single artist pavilion that presents in a way a kind of, um, you know, incredibly wonderful just journey through his work from 1953 until the late 90s. And he um, was in a way unique among his uh, neo Dada contemporaries in the 1950s in saying that for him, um, modern art was not disconnected from the past, but that all art was vitally contemporary. And I think uh, that's a sort of sensibility that perhaps would have resonated with um, with the Diminals, especially too. Um, yes, definitely. Maybe we could also put up this image um, of the current installation of the foyer, which shows Warhol's um, seven panel um, kind of portrait of Jermaine McKeague, who you've mentioned before, Sandra, but to give some more uh, kind of color on that relationship, she was hired um, on a three-year contract at the Contemporary Arts Association, what is now the Contemporary Arts Museum Houston in 1955, and was really instrumental in putting on these fabulous, really kind of immersive um, exhibitions. And the Diminals were a great champion of hers. Absolutely, yes, and and so much so that they commissioned this portrait by Warhol um, posthumously because Jermaine McGaggy died in 1964, mm -hmm. um, and she trained at the Fogg Museum, you know, the same place that Alfred Barr trained at, um, just a little bit later than he did. So she kind of comes out of that same. Um, school, if you will. And if we can go to the image just before this one, I think, oh, sorry, two before maybe. <laughs> Here we go, scrolling. Um, mm -hmm. This is a very famous exhibition that she put on in 1959, Totems Not Taboo, which was curated at the Museum of Fine Arts Houston, but obviously very much with the support of the Manils, with the Manils collection. And Renee Darnancourt, the director of MoMA, saw it and said it was one of the three like most profound exhibitions he'd ever experienced it. I'm showing on the left his exhibition, Arts of the South Seas, from 1946. Um, 
And so Jermaine McKay kind of brought this very immersive installation style um, to the Manil's collection, not to the Manil collection, but um, mm -hmm. <laughs> to their works and how they were going to be displayed and had a very strong bond with the Manil's. Um, and so maybe if we go two forward or three forward, um, back to, yeah, here we go, um, where you can see um, how the Manils also kind of kept this portrait at times like in their home, which you can see on the right. And what I also love about the juxtaposition of these two images is that you can you can see the Ottoman um, yeah. that was Dominique de Manil's Ottoman from the home is also in the foyer of the Manil collection. So kind mm -hmm. of, again, cross-referencing um, Philip Johnson's modernist design for the home and Renzo Piano's um, more like almost, you know, it's a mod, they're both modest modernist buildings, mm -hmm. um, but also very welcoming um, and domestic in their own ways. Yes. I mean, there's this great um, sort of line um, that when Dominique de Manil was working with Renzo Piano to design the building, she um, said she wanted a building that felt as small as possible from the outside and as large as possible on the inside. Um, and that they sort of discover that the way to do that was to have this abundance of natural light, which you can see already in this image of the foyer installation. But that is another kind of hallmark of the, um, so, you know, our permanent collection displays. And that reminded me, in fact, already when you were mentioned, showed that early image of MoMA and remarked how it was sort of looked like a factory, except for the fact that there were these, um, you know, large windows sort of, you um, you know, in single succession along the top. So that that too is another kind of early, um, you know, perhaps connection between the two, if a more um, incidental and less programmatic one. Yeah, I mean, I think something that you posed to me earlier about sort of uh, the philosophies of early MoMA and the Manils, it just, um, it really struck me that I wonder if the Manila collection is sort of what MoMA could have been if it hadn't kind of transformed into mm -hmm. such a rigid institution, um, which didn't happen under Barr or Darnancourt, but happened later, I would say, mm -hmm. in the later. Yeah, I mean, one thing that reading your book makes me wonder is precisely, as you say, sort of the path that I've taken if this, um, as you say, experimental, quirky, and decidedly non-neutral um, museum that was that existed in the first 20 years i mean it's impossible to know but what might have happened if it had if that was just like how it had been for the next you know 60 years yeah i have a question um from natalie heron that um i think is a nice way for us to wrap up and is touching on something that we've been um sort of circling around too, but she writes, you alluded to the perceived MoMA canon that would eventually be formed and would ultimately obscure this early period in the museum's history. And can you speak more about when and how that kind of canonical, um, as you said at one point, sort of teleological narrative came to usurp this earlier, more diverse and unsettled experimental phase? Um, yeah, I think that that happened when MoMA expanded yet again um, in 1964 and Barr retires soon after that. Um, and so once they have a permanent collection, expand the building, um, it's still slightly quirky, but now they've like installed it kind of um, in this way in 1964 where they're, they're still, they never use the word canon, right? Um, in 1964, they're saying, we're gonna give you a panorama um, <laughs> of art. Um, but, and, and even then, I think very importantly, it opens with self-taught artists, which is another in, um, interest of yes. the Manils. Um, so always the first room was self-taught artists. So again, gesturing to that, democracy that I think Barr felt like was at the heart of um, modern art and the Museum of Modern Art's mission. And then later, William Rubin comes in and uh -huh. opens with Cezanne. And that's really, you know, from Cezanne, we go to Picasso and from Picasso, right. you know, onwards. And from there, it becomes a kind of a, like the narrative in a way. Yes. Or at and least that, what I, in many ways, learned as like the narrative. As we all kind of, of did. And I think, of course, of development. Yeah, only recently, I think mm -hmm. we're 
we're all coming to the realization that this absolutely must be disrupted. Um, yeah. Many, many museums have already disrupted it, um, but the tools I think are right there. Um, you know, MoMA always had, or always early on at least had this expansive notion of what modernism could encompass. So many different mediums from all really a truly global notion. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think museums are working towards that. Um, yeah. Yeah, we're, we're working against the 60s, not the 30s and the 40s. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah, it's a great way of thinking about it, that it's not as though this activity of unsettling canons and, and being experimental, it's not a new activity. In a, in a way, it's, um, you know, a very old one, and it's that yeah. sort of chapter, or the spirit of that chapter, this um, willingness to, to get things wrong, as you told us about to, that, that needs to kind of come to the fore. And to like, you know, recognize that that museums were never neutral, right? Mm -hmm. Like the Manil was founded with social activism, like at the heart yeah. of it, um, which if we can just go to um, the Barnett Newman slide for one moment, I would love to show. Um, yeah, and then we'll have to wrap up. <laughs> yes, I know, I know. But um, yeah, like democracy was at the heart of MoMA's founding and I think activism um, and civil rights mm -hmm. were at the heart of the Manil's founding. Yes. Um, especially, so here's, there's only three broken obelisks and MoMA owns one and the Manil owns the other. And of course, as is well known, um, the Manil, the Manil's tried to donate broken obelisk on behalf, you know, to the city of Houston, um, dedicated to the legacy of Martin Luther King, who had recently been assassinated. Um, and, the, and the donation was refused. So, um, yes, and so they took it and put it um, on the grounds of the Rothko Chapel. And when it was opened in February of 1971, uh, the chapel opened with the sculpture um, outside it where it stands now. And Dominique made this really powerful speech at that on that occasion, dedicating the Rothko Chapel and declaring it a place for non-denominational worship and social justice. And um, and said that the 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 fact of both works being there together was really important, and that it reminded her. She said that there is no love without justice, and that those always had to be, you know, kind of tethered together in an ongoing sort of, um, you know, struggle. So I'm afraid we have to leave it on this very like tantalizing notion of having so much more to say. But I encourage everyone who is, you know been interested to learn more or has sent in questions that we couldn't address to get a copy of Sandra and Austin's wonderful book. It's available at the Manil Bookstore and you can email bookstore at manil.org if you'd like to reserve a copy um, to go pick up or to have it shipped to you. And then our next program will be an in dialogue next Tuesday, so in just one week, where artists Jennifer Alora and Guillermo Calzadilla, who have a fabulous exhibition up at the Manila right now. We'll be joined by writers Johanna Aguiak, Molly Nesbitt, and Roberto Tejada for a program that considers the influence of the poet Aimé Césaire on their exhibition at the Manila Spectres of Noon. Um, I think that's about it. Sandra, so thank you so much for a really fun hour of delving thank into these yeah. parallels. Thank histories. you so much for having me. It's been wonderful to talk about the book and about the Manila. Yes, I mean, it's it's been a pleasure, of course. So thanks to everyone for joining us from wherever you are. And we look forward to seeing you at our next program soon.